may possibly hear from a couple more of our confirmation candidates. They're kind of deciding whether they can handle the big crowd or not, and I'm hoping they can. In any case, before we begin with our word, let's bow our heads with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you because you are good. You have proven yourself over and over again how faithful and how mighty and how good you are. As we look back on the year of 2012, certainly there were very difficult moments, but you have seen us through every single one of them. We're reminded in this holiday season what it means to have a God who is Emmanuel, who is God who is with us on this earth. As we reflect on the years that have gone by, we look forward to 2013, knowing that you are a God of goodness, a God of hope, a God of strength, mighty God. We pray, Lord, that you bless us. Would you open up our ears to hear, our hearts to understand, our minds to perceive, Lord, your word for us today. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Please turn to Joshua chapter 24. Now we all know Joshua as the guy who went in and conquered the promised land. And believe it or not, does anyone know how old he kind of was before he went into the promised land? Any, any takers? Yes, 13. He, he died at 110, and the conquest took about two decades. So you do your math, he's close to 90 when God has asked him to go into the promised land and conquer it. So it's a huge ordeal for somebody who's 90 years old. And yet he was strong. And he goes in, and at this point in, our, um, in the book of Joshua, chapter 24, he realized that he's going to die. He's going to die, and so what happens here is what we call a covenant renewal ceremony. Okay. One of the covenants that God has given to us on this earth is the covenant of marriage. And it's a serious thing. There's a line in the vows that say, till death do us part. And so we begin to understand that this is not just, ah, yeah, whatever, we're going to come before God, Joshua is dying. When Moses was dying, it was a big deal. And Moses hands off the leadership to Joshua. Be strong and courageous. 20 years goes by. And now their other leader, the one who had actually lived and was discipled by Moses, is going to die. It's a big deal. Okay? So Joshua gathers them all. Okay? Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and summoned the elders, the heads, the judges, and the officers of Israel, and they presented themselves before God. When you present yourself before the court of law, it's a formal situation. You're getting in trouble because you've broken the law. When you present yourselves before um, your school because you're graduating, it's a formal occasion. When Israel presents themselves before God, something is happening here. They're coming together because another age in the history of God's people is coming to an end. One of their leaders is going to pass on because we're all human and we all die. And Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, long ago. So this is what's happening. God's people gather. And they look back and they're like, Listen, Joshua recalls to their memory everything that God has done before. So here we are. 2012, the end of it at least. I remember preaching 2011, the end of it, to you guys. Some of you guys are older now. Actually, all of you guys are older. Okay? I remember the New Year's Eve sermon last year. I remember what Reverend Lim preached on because I translated it. The idea that everything passes away. And one year goes by, and my question to you is, what is your New Year resolution for this year? Because we make all these superficial ones. I'm going to be taller, I'm going to exercise more, I'm going to lose weight, I'm going to do better in school. That's all fine and good. But my question to all of you here who come to worship God is, do you know God more today than this time last year? Because if you don't, that's a problem. It's a huge problem. That is what we call a waste of a year. You may have done all these great things between January to January of last year. This past year that has gone by. But if you have not grown in faith, I wonder why you bother coming every Sunday to this place. To worship a God who will constantly reveal himself to you, but we don't receive. And that's what's going on here. And one of the things that Joshua does is he's perfectly aware of the sinful nature of Israel. You and I, we're perfectly aware of our sinful nature. We know that we make New Year's resolutions to keep our diet plan and fall short by the end of January because Pastor Lisa's going to take you out or Pastor Sarah's going to take you to McDonald's. We're good at that. We can make you guys break your diet habits. But what about your spiritual?
spiritual ones, because that's where it really counts. And as Joshua is looking towards the end of his life, in verses 29, which is just outside of today's passage, it tells us that he dies at 110 years old. He knows that he's going to pass. He knows that his time is ending, at least on this earth. And in the same way that Moses gathered all of Israel when he was dying, he gathers all of Israel and he says, listen, I'm going to remind you of how good God is. And that's why he begins with, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Long ago your fathers lived beyond the Euphrates, Terah the father of Abraham. So we're going way back before even Abraham to his father Terah. Abraham and Amnera, and they served other gods. Because remember, at that point, nobody knew God. Because after the flood, everything was done away with. And at one point in Genesis, God calls Abraham, Genesis chapter 12. And that's when God's people begin. And Joshua goes all the way back there. Because it's important for us to recognize who God is as the God of history. The God of Israel. The father of Abraham and Nahor, and they served other gods, but God called them. Then I took your father Abraham from beyond the river and led him through all the land of Canaan and made his offspring many. I gave him Isaac. Remember in his old years when everyone said it was impossible, and those two, Abraham and Sarah, both laughed because they didn't think that they would have a child. I gave them Isaac. And to Isaac, I gave the twins Jacob and Esau. And I gave Esau the hill country of Seir to possess. But Jacob and his children went down to Egypt. And that's the entire story of the life of Joseph. How God brings his people to Egypt. Because there was a famine in the land. And he delivered Israel from that famine by bringing them to Egypt. And by having one of their own brothers become the second in command. So that he could provide for all of God's people. They spent so much time there. That they grow in number. And so we're reminded in this first section of their history that God is the one who calls us to faith. Okay, so let's just have a microcosm of our lives here. So my 31 years, I remember when faith became alive to me. I was born in a Christian home very much like Caleb, very much like all of you, most of you I should say. Born in a Christian home, I remember that. I remember going to the retreats growing up. I remember the sermons. And I remember the day, or the moment, or the gradually how it became real to me. This God is alive. He is my God. I understand that history because I've lived it, I've experienced it. I remember my personal history with God. And that personal history ties into the history of this book. I know the God of Abraham. I know the God of Isaac. I know the God of Jacob. So let us remember on this day who that God is. Fast, rewind. January 2012. This entire year that went by, how faithful was God to you? Caleb points back to Chicago GK. Some of you point back to Haiti. Some of you point back to the summer retreat. Maybe it's India. Maybe it was just a personal tough moment, not a church thing. But you remember that you are here this day in the presence of God with a place to worship with a family who loves you, with friends who want to grow with you, with the pastors who care for you, with leaders who want to teach you. You remember who God is. Because there's something to be said for knowing who your God is. How far He's brought you. This is why Joshua takes the time in front of all of God's people to make them remember. Because if you forget, He's going to make you remember. And that's the exercise I want us to go through at the every year. Because at December 31st of every year, it's like a mini covenant renewal for us. Because that's when we say, oh, we'll start again, whatever. But really, if your intention isn't there, what's the point? I was sharing this with our link group this morning. The one that I took over, at least, for the time being. Okay? Sometimes we make promises, but we're more interested in what we're going to get rather than keeping the promise. So we say to our parents, if you let us go out, we'll clean our room. You just want to go out. You don't really want to clean your room. And that's sometimes how we treat New Year's resolutions with God. If you give me this, I'm going to do this. I'm going to read the Bible so that by the time I graduate high C, I'm going to get into the school I want. That's a faulty theology. That is not what we teach here. And that is not the kind of faith that we want to grow in. Rather, look back on the life that you lead. From the day that you were born, from before you were born, from the day that your parents were called to Christ. Rewind a little bit more from the day that the first missionary set foot into Korea and gave our people the gospel. Let's rewind a little bit more from the moment that the church was established 
after the disciples went out and shared the gospel to the rest of the world. Let's rewind a little bit more. When Christ inaugurated the new covenant when he died on the cross, rewind a little bit more, and we find that our history ties back into exactly what Joshua is saying here. The God of your fathers. When the God called Abraham from that moment, he had a plan to save. He had a plan that every single one of us would be sitting here at the end of 2012 looking forward to 2013 with an idea and with a hope, with an inspiration to continue following Him. Because God is the one who calls us. He is a God of faithfulness and He is a God of history. That is the first thing that Joshua reminds us as he goes back into the patriarchal history of the Old Testament. And then he continues on. And I sent Moses and Aaron and I plagued Egypt with what I did in the midst of it, and afterward I brought you up. That's like a really, really one-line summary of Exodus. I brought you up, all the great plagues that I performed, me delivering you as you sat there by the Red Sea, unable to move. Remember Lim preached on the title of God, that Christ child, mighty God, El Gabor in Hebrew, one who fights on your behalf. When you thought that nothing else would get you out of wherever you were, God came. You were healed. You made it past everything, and here you sit. He is mighty, God. Then I brought your fathers out of Egypt, and you came to the sea, and the Egyptians pursued your fathers with chariots and horsemen to the Red Sea. And when they cried to the Lord, he put darkness between you and the Egyptians. And he made the sea come up upon them and cover them. And your eyes saw what I did in Egypt. And you lived in the wilderness a long time. So basically, we begin to understand that God is a God of mighty deeds. We trivialize the fact that we get up every morning. Not everyone does. People die overnight all the time. By the grace of God, we get up and we go to school. Okay. The God of mighty deeds who has brought you this far who has healed people in this very church, who has shown you things, what he does in countries where the gospel is just on the burgeoning and exploding on the scene. He has shown you these things, so remember them. Because a time will come in 2013 when you will question. And will you will wonder if God is strong enough. And he says, remember what I did. Not only in the span of your 12, 13 years for grade sevens, or your 17, 18 years, for you grade 12s, or the 50 years for people who are older, or for the 100 years, or for the 200 years. We're talking about a God who has consistently shown himself faithful. One of the reasons why John writes the way he does in his gospel, it's one of the series we'll go over, the eight signs in the gospel of John to show us how mighty God is. Our God is greater. Our God is strong. Our God is able. We say all these things, but we go into every new year, every difficult situation, shaking in our spiritual boots. Who do you think God is? Have you read this book? Have you seen the things that he's done? Because he's the same God who is alive and breathing and speaking to you today. You get to know this God. Look back in 2012. See how he's brought you here. Remember that not only is a God is God who is faithful, but He is a God of mighty deeds. He delivers you. You are here. You are worshiping in a very nice sanctuary, in a magnificent church, in a great country with opportunities that nobody else has in the rest of the world. So you tell me if your God is mighty or not. Remember the things that God has done. He continues on in this history and says, Then I brought you to the land of the Amorites who lived on the other side of the Jordan. They fought with you, but I gave them into your hand, and you took possession of their land, and I destroyed them for you. Again, this image of a God who fights for his people. Then Balak, son of Zippor, king of Moab, arose and fought against Israel. And he sent and invited Balaam, the son of Baal, to curse him. But I would not listen to Balaam. Indeed, he blessed you and said, So this world is full of people who wish bad things upon us, whether we deserve them or not. But we understand that God is not only able, he is good. Every prophecy that comes, yes, there's punishment for our sin, but the tail end of it, God always restores, He always blesses. Jeremiah 29, remember this, I gave this to the graduate students in June. He has plans to prosper you. You remember who that God is. When Balaam came to curse Israel, he couldn't get the words out.
won't because God forbid him to curse his people. You will bless my people. This is a God that you serve. This is the kind of inspiration that I want you to have when you look back on 2012 and you look forward to 2013. There is blessing when you are with God. There is hardship to be sure, but even in that hardship there is joy. In every step that you take, every step that Joshua took into the land of conquest is 90 years, it even sounds exhausting to me, and 90 years going in to conquer a land. 20 years of more fighting because God asked him to do so. And God tells him at the beginning of those 20 years, be strong and courageous. And he goes. And every step that he takes, he claims for Israel. He claims for his God. And at the end, he looks back and says, I know that God fights for me. Because at 90 years, with a bunch of people who are very you know, untrained as warriors, we were able to defeat the enemy. He remembers that God is not only able, but he is good and he blesses. This is a God that you serve. This is a God that you ought to know. Indeed, he blessed you, so I delivered you out of his hand. And then you went to over the Jordan and came to Jericho, and the leaders of Jericho fought against you. And all the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Hivites, the Jebusites. So basically everyone in the land who's your enemy, I gave them into your hand. Okay. Who is it? But what is it that weighs you down in this world? Is it an idea? Is it a person? A concept? Is it, is it a situation? Because truly, if God is for us, who can stand against us? Isn't that what Paul writes to us, to encourage us as the church begins to grow in the first century? If God is what drives back the enemy, and darkness trembles at his light, the light of the world who came down, who is it? that can stop you in 2013, if you choose to be faithful to God. And I sent them the hornet before you, which drove them out before you, the two kings of the Amorites. It was not by your sword. It was not by your bow. It was not by your intelligence or your good looks or your ability that these people were driven out. It was by my hand, says the Lord. And so it was in 2013. And so it will be in all the years to come. Do not be fooled. Without God, we are not able. We're just like everybody else who sins and falls short, who is discouraged and falls into depression, never be able to get out again. We are like everybody, everybody else who serves other gods and has an empty promise and false lies and no resolution and no, no umph, no determination to fall upon. You took the cities that you had not built and you dwell in them. You eat the fruit of your vineyards and the olive orchards that you did not plant. So here's a testament to your parents who pray for you. You are in this church that you did not build. You are in this church that the elders built and planted for. They are in this church that God helped them build. You have a life that you did not claim to be your own, but God did. There's a humility that comes when you begin to know who God is. And there's a confidence that comes from that as well, because it's the next few verses that I want to concentrate on as well. And Joshua, after he goes through this history of 20 years, um, after these, he goes through the history of Israel, basically, he stops. And he says, listen, I'm telling you right now everything that God has done for you. Okay? In the same way, Pastor Sarah and myself, your link leaders, every time we open the Bible, we are telling you who your God is. We are telling you what He has done. Every time you come back and you hear students from this place telling the testimony of what God has done on the mission field, we are telling you who God is. So pay attention. Because as we tell you who God is, this is a conviction that Joshua has. And he says before everyone, Now therefore fear the Lord and serve Him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your fathers served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. In other words, quite simply, listen, we're telling you everything about this God, that He is good, that He is able, that He is mighty God. We're showing you who He is, that He's loving, that He's generous, that He's kind, that He can get you through any single distress that you encounter. We're telling you, revealing to you by God's Word who He is, and He reveals Himself to you as well by the deeds that He does. Now you choose for yourself, as you look back on 2012, which God you will serve. Because there's a lot out there. And Joshua basically says, you pick. 
All the gods in this world, side note, every god is the same god, just repackaged in a new ideal and a new age. Same gods out there, power, prestige, money, lust, greed, all those things, popularity, false security. You choose for yourself, says Joshua, whom you will serve. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord with full authority and confidence. For this ministry, we will serve the Lord. I can boldly make that claim. Now the problem is that you guys don't get into heaven by my faith. You don't get into heaven by the proclamation of Pastor Sarah or any of your link leaders. So the choice does come down to you. As for you and your friends, who will you choose to serve? Because that's the question I want you guys to answer. Because every new year we have these resolutions that mean nothing. And resolutions have become like almost like a pastime where you can see who can keep it the longest, but everyone, eventually everyone's going to break it. But the idea of resolution comes from the word resolve. And resolve has a determination to it. I resolve to follow God. I resolve that me and my household will serve the Lord. You can serve wherever you want, but as for me and my household, there's a determination there. There's an intention there. There's a decision there in resolution. So I'm not, I don't really care about the superficial resolutions you make, whether to go on a diet or not. I love you guys all anyway. Spiritually speaking, choose one and keep it. And this time next year, you will have grown. Take my word for it, but more so take God's word for it. He is always faithful. And it's interesting what happens after that. Because after Joshua throws out this idea that as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, Israel comes along. And Israel comes along and says, you know what, we're going to serve God too. Far be it from us, this is verse 16, that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For it is the Lord our God who brought us out of, and our forefathers out of the land of Egypt. So they know. They talk about the great signs. And they basically regurgitate everything that Joshua has said to them. And they say, we will also serve the Lord, for he is our God. And Joshua says, listen, and he gives them a warning here. You are not able to serve the Lord, for he is a holy God, and he is a jealous God. He will not forgive the transgressions of your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, then he will turn and do harm and consume you after having done you good. And the people say, no, 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 we can do this. We're going to get into the book of Judges, starting in April. And that book comes right after Joshua. That whole segment, if you will. And we learn in the book of Judges that Israel is not faithful. They fail to meet that standard. They chase after all the gods under the sun. And they are punished for it. Now one of the hopes is this. You and I cannot keep these promises ourselves. Very, in a nutshell idea, the Old Testament was not designed to make us feel guilty. The Old Testament, the Old Covenant, was designed to show us that we fall short of God's holiness. New Testament, the day and age that you and I live in, was designed to show us that we no longer need the Old Covenant because Christ came down. We're not Israel standing before Joshua. You are people in the New Covenant standing before a holy God who has given us His Son and has given, us, given you the Spirit so that every spiritual resolution you make, you have it in you because God has given it to you to keep. So none of this spineless, cowardly faith that this world sucks us into. I'm going to challenge you guys to have some resolve. To make the choice to be faithful, to come to worship, fully engaged and not tired. Okay, so make the resolution to decide whether or not this is your year to be confirmed. Make the resolution, if you want to go on missions and experience God there, make the resolution to save up for it. Make the resolution to try and honor your parents. Make the resolution to read the Bible. Make a determined, focused, intentional decision to pray more and see what happens. Because God deserves more than broken promises. God deserves more than a half-baked worship. He deserves more than just lines that we sell to him so we can get what we want. Okay, grade 11s and 12s resolve to be leaders, servant leaders, that encourage your younger brothers and sisters to show them what it means to be young people who choose. College students, I see a lot of you here, resolve 
to be your own person, not what this world says you are. Or the world tells you these ideas that this is what you want to be. You choose for yourself whether you're going to follow God or not. And the decision is on you. And the blessings come because of your boldness. And the consequences come because of your disobedience. Okay? Faith is a choice. And once we choose God, He inspires us. And He gives us a courage and humility to follow. That's what is going to characterize, as far as I'm concerned, from the leadership of this ministry, this is what's going to characterize 2013. And we want you guys to follow. And we want you guys to choose. Dr. Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. says this. Take the first step in faith. You don't have to see the whole staircase. Just take the first step. We don't want you to figure out exactly where you're going to be this time next year. Because truly, who knows? Maybe that Mayans were off a year. And we're all, I don't know, what's going to end next year sometime in December. We don't know these things. All I know now is what I'm going to do here. All you know now is how are you going to set the stage for 2013. On January 1st, you only know whether you're going to read the Bible on that day or not. On January 2nd, you're going to know whether you're going to read the Bible on that day or not. On January 3rd, you're only going to know whether you have the ability or the time or the life to pray to God on that day. That's all we're asking you to do. And as you take that first step, the next step is also going to be a first step. And that's what we talk about when we say consistent spiritual growth. So by this time next year, we are all strong. And the ministry is characterized by worship and humility and young people who choose. Okay. Stop reacting to the world. Resolve to grow spiritually. Resolve to love God. Resolve to know God. Okay. Resolve to be a household that follows God in the same way that Joshua declared in front of all the people. Now he dies at 110 years old. And tells us in verse 31 that Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua. And all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua had known all the work that the Lord did for Israel. So as long as our generation is living on this earth, as long as you have influence over the generation after you, I implore you to choose God on this day. You will see the blessings that 2013 comes. My encouragement for you is this. Go home today. I hope to see all of you, or most of you at least, tomorrow night, to spend that passing of the year. I remember um, the, I remember 1999, because that was when I turned, 1999 to 2000 was when I turned 18. I remember that, because I said, this day I'm going to spend at church. Actually, I spend most New Year's at church, but that was a particular one. I remember the watch that I was wearing, because I was looking at the countdown. Because that was when I was becoming legally an adult. And I said, from this point on, I will do my best. I'm always successful. But that's not what he asked. He just asks for as much as we can give. And the rest, that is mercy and grace. So as we get into 2013, go home, pray. Ask God what is it that he wants you to give to him. And ask for resolve to carry it through. Amen? Amen. Heavenly Father, we come before you today and we just pray. We pray, Lord, that you reveal to us all the good things that you've done in the past. That we forget nothing of your goodness. That we would actively remember and we would search after your goodness in the future. Your promise is blessing because you are a good God. Not because we throw up all these promises and they just end up being broken, but because you have said that though we are faithless, you are faithful. So we hang on to that, Lord. I pray, Lord, for this generation, for these young people in this ministry. I pray, Lord, that you would inspire them deeply, keep them humble, keep them encouraged, keep them sharp in their minds as they read your word. Keep them humble on their knees as they engage with you in prayer. We pray, Lord, for the link leaders, for Pastor Sarah and myself as we continue in all humility, Lord, to lead this ministry. We pray for wisdom. We pray, Lord, that 2013 will be characterized by a true love for you. We pray, Lord, that it be characterized by boldness and courage. And that one day when we're all 90 or looking into 110 years, whatever it is, whatever years that you've allotted for us on this earth, that we will look back and say that you have been faithful. And that as far as we are concerned, as far as this ministry, as far as we and our friends are concerned, we have followed you. We thank you, Lord, for all these things and we pray in the holy name of Christ. Amen.
Uh, no, James is not here. <laughs> okay, so um, a couple of brief announcements. Again, tomorrow night, the New Year's Eve service will start at 11 p.m. You're more than welcome to come a little bit earlier. My office is open if you guys want to come and chill with me. Also, on Saturday, January 12th, um, morning, Tim starts at 6.30. That is a very 